OK, this talk is called Rust for Languagists. Um, and the reason it's called that is because I love alliteration. I am nominally a Ruby programmer. I do that most of my time is in Ruby. Um, and so I wrote a community tutorial called Rust for Rubyists a little over a year, almost a year and a half ago now. Wow, time flies. Um, about Mozilla's programming language Rust. And so rather than making this be about Rust for Rubyists, this is a more general Rust for programmers that are interested in Mozilla's Rust. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the language of Rust itself and some like meta stuff about Rust. Um, and then we're going to dig into a bunch of code. And I want to show you what Rust is like, a bunch of its features and unique advantages. Uh, and then I want to give you a link to a bunch of resources to learn more about Rust if you hopefully are super psyched about it like I am. Um, so those are sort of the big three sections to this talk. So about the language itself, who is familiar with Rust at all, by the way? Is this going to be cool? So I've got some people a little bit. Awesome. I will go into all the details then. Rust. Um, so Rust is a really interesting new programming language. Um, I say that it's interesting because it's doing a lot of stuff that is really unique. And it's also innovating in a space that has not seen significant amounts of new things in a while. Um, basically, Rust is a good choice when you would choose C++. So that's how you primarily should think about Rust is I need super low level control. I need to make sure that I manage my memory allocations correctly. Um, I want to do all these things. Uh, so I use C++. Rust would be a replacement for all of the use cases that C++ is used for. It also may be useful at other times. So like I said, I program in Ruby most days, and I got really interested in Rust. And there's actually a significant chunk of Rubyists and Pythonistas, Pythonistas um, in Rust world. So you sort of have people um, that are coming from the super low-level systems. I want a better C++. And you have people coming from even the like, Haskell and ML community. Um, you have like, high-level people who are interested in doing more low-level stuff. So you kind of have these dual sides. Um, in, in three like, semi-buzzword things, uh, Rust is a system language that's pursuing the trifecta of safe, concurrent, and fast. So um, the primary thing Rust is concerned about is safety. And we'll talk more about what that means later. But that is the driving force of everything else in the language. So for example, uh, Rust does not have tail call optimization because it cannot actually guarantee certain things about its safety. And so until someone fixes the theoretical holes in that system, Rust will not do TCO because safety is paramount above all else. Um, concurrency. This was originally a, an explicit design goal, but it's sort of fallen out of the safety design goal. So because Rust is memory safe, it wants to be concurrent really well. And as it turns out, uh, concurrency is generally not safe. So by providing safe language primitives, we actually make concurrency significantly easier to write and reason about in Rust as opposed to other languages. Let's talk about what that means. And finally, fast. Um, you can't replace C++ without being as fast as C++. And so uh, most of the stuff that Rust does is actually at compile time. So it will actually compile what looks like a more complicated uh, structure into something that is the equivalent assembly that uh, would be generated by a C++ compiler. Um, and so the, like, the goal is to be like, if we're within 10%, if we are not within 10% of the speed of C++, we have failed utterly. And hopefully it will be equivalent. And maybe even sometimes faster, maybe, maybe, um, in the future. So those are the three big things that Rust is all about. Um, I've been toying around with this idea of calling Rust an ownership-oriented programming language, because as we all know, every new language needs its own set of buzzwords to generate its own set of blog posts and conference talks and books and shenanigans. So I've been joking that ownership-oriented programming is the next hot trend that you can get certified as an ownership master or whatever. I don't know. But um, ownership is a, is a very key concept in Rust. And if you're not familiar with C++, or maybe if you are, you might not know what that means. I will elaborate later. Um, so the origins. Rust was written by this man named Graydon Hoar. And uh, he works at Mozilla. Um, and he basically was building this language in his spare time. So he was originally, originally, originally writing a C++ compiler, because there are people who write C++ compilers for fun. And at, that point, at some point, he got to a certain edge case in the spec, and he was like, why am I doing this? This is terrible. We should make a better language, which is like how everyone starts, right? Many, many a programmer has fallen to the C++ is terrible. I'm going to do it better. Um, but Graydon actually persevered. And he got a job at Mozilla. And about the time, I think it was like two years into the development of Rust, um, he uh, was working at Mozilla. And Mozilla wanted to spin up an R&D division. 
And so they were like looking for interesting projects to go under the new R&D umbrella. And so the CTO of Mozilla, Brandon Ike, um, had said specifically like, hey, I think Rust is super cool, but I'm not sure how it fits into Mozilla's vision. Could you pitch me on why I should make Rust the first project of Mozilla's R&D branch? And Graydon uh, managed to convince him, which I'll explain why in a second. But then, so basically, it became an official research project of Mozilla. And they now pay people to work on the language full time. Graydon is actually no longer in charge of the language. He has moved on to other things. And we have a new uh, you know, person. So in some degrees, that's its own definition of maturity, right? Is when your project outlives you, that's when it's like real. Um, so there's interesting that. Um, the reason that, that uh, Mozilla decided to take on Rust is that Mozilla writes a lot of C++ code. Like Firefox is massive, right? And they also feel the pain of writing lots of C++ code. So uh, unless you have written a lot of C++ and sort of have like Stockholm Syndrome about it, writing C++ is terrible. Um, I like straight up C better than C++ personally. But um, there's good reasons to use it in certain times. And I don't think that they're wrong for using it. But they feel the pain of using it. And there's, that pain comes across in multiple ways. Sometimes it's compilation times. Sometimes it's security vulnerabilities. So for example, the pwn to own competition that happens every so often, um, where security researchers get together and try to hack web browsers. In the last pwn to own all three of the bugs that were found in Firefox were all related to essentially mismanaged pointers. So uh, two of them were like buffer overflows. The last one was like a mismanaged like pointer to some arbitrary point in memory. I don't remember the details, but the point is it was C++ problems. Like in a, in a language that's not C++, those would not have happened. And so those lead to security vulnerabilities. They lead to like terrible refactoring problems. Um, so Firefox does not currently have the one process per tab thing that other browsers have. And the reason why is that when someone actually spec'd out like what it would take to rewrite the relevant chunks of Gecko to make that happen, they estimate it's about 18 month project. So they're like working on it, but it's going to take a while. And it's going to take a while because that's not a non-significant improvement. And code bases that have grown uh, over decades are complicated, right? So. Um, and you have to be super careful, because if you miss, if you screw up one pointer, you're hosed. So it's like very, very hard to do so. So that's why Mozilla cares about this language. Um, stability. This is the one problem with Rust at the moment, um, but it's getting better. This slide says currently. That will not technically be true until like tomorrow afternoon. So uh, currently, whoever's watching this video later, Rust is at version 0.10. Um, and basically, every release is a three-month snapshot of whatever happened. So 0 0.9 was almost three months ago. Um, actually, maybe even they released 0 0.10 today. I'm not sure. It is this week is when 0 0.10 is coming out. So I made all these slides. I, made, I checked them as ver edge version of the compiler from yesterday. So there shouldn't be any last moment significant changes uh, in this code. But um, it's currently snapshot development, so they're not backwards compatible at all. Um, a 1.0 is coming, this says soon. It's actually like this year is what soon means. Um, and at the 1.0 mark, Rust will become super stable and not break anything and be mega backwards compatible. So it's been about five years of development currently um, into Rust. And lots of stuff changes every release because we currently discover better and better ways of doing all the things that we're doing. Um, and we're, I think there's 47 backwards compatible changes that are left to happen before 1.0 actually ships. Um, so it's getting there, and it's very close. But this is the problem about using Rust today, is that you basically have to pay attention to people say, like, oh, you're using a compiler for two months ago. That's really old. You should like recompile your compiler. Um, and it makes it hard to learn with tutorials, because they're significantly out of date after a period of time. So that is the problem. It will be fixed at 1.0. I'm telling you about this because of a couple reasons. Um, First of all, as we approach 1.0, you, you want to get more people involved who have not seen the language before, because they're the ones that are hopefully going to end up using it. And you want them to raise any red flags before the 1.0 release actually happens, and we make that promise forever. right? So the worst possible thing you can do, this is always my, my least favorite part about, um, I, I've committed to Rails, and I like, worked on Rails for a long period of time. And um, the number one thing that would super bug me is bug reports that were filed the day after the release. Like we would do like, hey, everyone, here's a release candidate. If we don't see any bugs in two weeks, we will cut a final. 
and then we'd like get one or two reports and we'd do it again and say, here's the next one, you know, whatever. And then it would never fail. The same day we would release the final, we'd get like 10 bug reports of like, this is totally broken on my machine. I'm like, why couldn't you have just told me like literally yesterday? Like, please just run the release candidate. So I, I hope that some of you get intrigued by Rust and come and help use it to point out any blind spots that we as a team have about making Rust happen. Um, OK, so some code. Um, and also, I should say, we, as far as Rust team goes, I'm not employed by Mozilla. I work for a company called Balanced Payments. We do credit card processing for marketplaces. And um, my interest in Rust is purely a like joy of programming. I love systems programming. And I've been doing Ruby and web stuff for the last couple of years. And so it's like scratching my own itch of returning down to the metal and like thinking about the difference between the stack and the heap again like is interesting. Um, but I am sort of the primary documenter of Rust. Um, I joke that I'm perpetually bad at Rust so that I can write documentation from the perspective of a newbie all the time, um, which is growing more and more not true. But that's sort of my like self-appointed role. Um, and I've written a significant amount of the documentation for Rust stuff. So I'm on the team, but not employed by Mozilla. OK, so some code. Now we got all that meta stuff out of the way. Let's actually like, show what Rust is. Before I want to talk about Rust, though, I want to show you some C code. So here is like what the most compelling aspect of Rust to me is what's the matter with this C code? So yeah, like I said, it's a little small. Let me try this plus thing again. Oh, that, that made it a little bit. It makes the arrows big and not the code. Whatever. Um, OK, so this is int main void, char star s equals hello world, asterisk s equals h. So this C code will completely compile. I believe on modern compilers it will give you a warning when you compile it saying, hey, you're doing something stupid. But the C compiler will happily turn this into assembly code. And when you run it, it will segfault. And I think I have the segfault error message. Um, oh, this is actually the Rust one. So wow, that big arrow makes it much slower to transition. So this will segfault because uh, S is actually you know, a statically allocated string. And you can't change stuff. And you, you know, like, when you try to modify it, it will blow up, um, basically. Um, so in Rust, if you wrote the equivalent code, um, and this top is what some like Rust code would look like, um, fn main bra bra uh, parentheses and then a bracket, let s equals ampersand hello world, and then dereference s to try to change it to h, Rust will actually give you a compile time error that says error, the type at str er, ampersand string cannot be dereferenced. Um, and this, this type cannot be dereferenced, because if it is dereferenced, then it would cause a seg fault. So Rust is able to tell you at compile time this is a problem. Now, as I mentioned, modern compilers will give you kind of a warning. But this is sort of the setup for everything else about Rust. It does a lot of work up front to guarantee things that would be errors in other low-level languages um, are actually caught. Um, and this example is a trivial one because they're slides, and I want to like ease you into this idea. But there are significantly more complicated things that are legal technically according to the specs but will give you failures um, when you, your code actually runs. Um, and so this is like what Rust is really good at, is saying, no, that doesn't compile. Um, I was a Haskell user for a little while. And Haskell people always say that like, once your Haskell code compiles, it works without bugs. And that's not totally true in Rust, but it's pretty damn true in many instances that like, you're, you will spend a lot of time fighting the compiler, but the compiler is actually like, telling you your code is actually wrong. And once you fix those problems, like, you're good. Um, just super different coming from Ruby unit testing. Like Ruby lets you do anything you want. Uh, OK, so here is an actual uh, hello world. And I decided to import the println for fun. Um, so Rust has an actual real module system. So you can say use standard IO and then import just the println function from the standard IO module. And it will only bring println into scope. Um, and then fn main println hello world. So this looks relatively similar. And the syntax of Rust, generally speaking, is trying to be familiar to people who have used systems level curly brace languages in the past. So this is like very close to what the C or C++ would be, except for you got the fn in there. And you don't need to define the arguments to main if you don't want to. Here's something a little more complex. Um, so let nums equal 1 and 2. Let noms equal Tim, Easton, Aaron, and Ben. And then let mute odds equal nums.iter.map. Uh, x times 2 minus 1 for num and odd spawn proc println some stuff. So this has a whole bunch of other interesting things about Rust. So um, 
the first thing to notice is the very first line, variables. So in Rust, you define variables using the let keywords. You say let nums equals, and that actually says what it is. Um, and then this is a uh, Rust calls arrays vectors. So this is a vector of two integers. Um, Rust actually does full Hindley-Milner type inference. So this is actually, even though we've not written any type signatures, Rust knows that noms or nums is a vector of type int. Like, it can infer that automatically. So you don't need to write that out if you wanted to. Same thing with noms. It can know that that is an array of strings. Um, the third line is super interesting, and one of the reasons why I think Rust is really neat and is that Rust has stolen a lot of really high-level concepts from languages like ML and Haskell and even Ruby, um, and then brings them down in this like performance systems way. So this takes nums.iter, which generates an iterator out of the uh, nums array, and then calls map on it. And if you're not familiar with map from various functional languages, map is basically a function that takes another function and then applies that function to every element of the list. So this function it takes one argument, x, um, it needs to be a pointer, um, and then it will take the value of x times 2 minus 1. So this will give you um, an iterator that returns the odd numbers in the list. In this case, there's only one. If you had more of them, there would be more, obviously. I probably should have made it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is it says let mute odds. So in Rust, variables are immutable by default. And you can add mutability by adding the mute keyword onto it. Um, this is generally considered to be wise advice for most people, um, that like mutable state is usually bad. You want to try to be immutable as much as possible. So I decided to make this iterator mutable to show that off. Um, I don't think it's actually strictly necessary. We don't use the mutability. And Rust will actually give you a warning and say, hey, you made this immutable, but you don't ever actually mutate it. So you should think about removing the mute. Um, then a for loop. So you know, the good old flashing C++ for loop with like the three sections where you start off at zero and you have an increment and it's all complicated, that all goes away and Rust actually gives you these like the more standard modern iterator style for loops, but it compiles down to the same stuff that the original for loop would have. So we can say for every num in odds, um, and then we have the spawn proc. So spawn is a function that takes a function as an argument and it spins up a thread and then runs that code in the thread. Um, this syntax has changed a couple of times. If you've ever looked at Rust before, this is the latest and final iteration, thank God, of this syntax. Um, and basically, uh, the proc creates a procedure which is like a closure, but instead of it, um, it is its stack frame is on the heap rather than the stack, so it can be moved to other threads without you needing to worry about mutating stuff. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. Um, basically, it just means that they're safe to pass around between tasks. So we're, Rust can actually implement task steal, uh, a work stealing task scheduler for threading stuff because they're all like, completely isolated. And then inside this, we'd use println bang, which is a macro. Um, Rust has hygienic macros instead of a, instead of a process, preprocessor like C++ or C, rather, I should say, that does textual substitution. Rust macros actually operate on the AST, which is super cool. And they give us these formatting strings, which are not printf formatting strings, but are like, I think Python supports the syntax, or so one or two other things. So the brace colon s brace gets you to substitute um, noms num, and then you can access you know, the first element, or second, I guess, because it's number one, of the noms array, and it will print out uh, Esten says hello from a lightweight thread. Um, so this is like the way it looks. It's like kind of familiar low-level stuff with this high-level stuff into it. And the thing that's interesting about this is that it's chosen in a way that it costs are always explicit. So I mentioned this, the uh, spawn syntax had changed. It used to be do spawn curly brace. And the problem with that is people wanted to make sure that you knew you were actually going to be allocating a closure and that kind of hid that you were allocating a closure. And so they decided to make it explicit. And so in some, like in generally, Rust will always try to make costs explicit to you. Um, so anyway, that's that. Um, so references, Rust has uh, two kinds of pointers that are built into the language. Um, the first one is references. So if we make a function called plus one that takes an x, which is a reference to an integer and returns an integer, we can make uh, dereference x plus one, and that will give us the value of what we pass in. Um, and then in there we can call println and just print out um, plus one of a reference to five. 
This is a dumb use of references because an integer is an integer size, so you wouldn't make a pointer to an integer. But because it's an, a slide illustration, I just wanted to show you this is like how it works. And this also gives you the syntax for defining functions. You can see that it's like identifier colon type, and then there's an arrow with a return type on the end um, for function definitions. And this will uh, take a reference to that five, send it to the function, it will do its stuff, and you'll get six back. Um, the other kind of pointer that is built into the language technically doesn't need to be built into the language. It could be implemented as a library. But it's so useful that we gave it special language syntax. And that we call these boxes. Um, you may have heard them referred to as owned pointers previously. But this, now we, def we declare let x equals tilde 5, and that's a box to 5. The difference to this is that in this version, you are sending a reference to a value on the, he on the stack. Um, like 5, the integer, is like stack allocated. This 5 will actually be heap allocated. Um, so this is a reference to something on the heap. If you're a C++ developer, this is very similar to the unique pointer in Boost. But it's at the language level, so you can make stronger guarantees. So the unique pointer is not actually truly memory safe, um, whereas this actually is. And so this will send in the value of x into plus 1. And um, using a reference in the type function signature doesn't change, because you're just taking a reference to what already exists. You can pass in either kind of pointer that you want. Um, and that's a box. So what's cool about this is another thing I love about Rust. So if I was doing this in C, I would need to be doing like um, malloc the size of an integer, right? And I need to be keeping track of where x goes out of scope, and I need to call free on it. So what Rust kind of does is Rust says, hey, at compile time, we know that this is a pointer to an integer. We know where the variable's in scope. So rather than making you, the programmer, do this chore of figuring out the amount of memory, allocating it, deallocating it, Rust essentially inserts a malloc before this comes into scope and a free after it comes out of scope and gives it the appropriate size because it knows all that stuff at compile time. So um, that's super cool. And one example of like reducing human errors by allowing the compiler to actually give you correct code instead. Um, so this has no performance penalty over malloc and free. It's basically the same thing at the assembly level. Um, so that's super cool. Tasks. So I showed you that spawn proc shenanigans before to um, talk about spinning up a task, which is a thread, basically, a lightweight thread. Um, but they're totally isolated from one another. So you can actually use channels to communicate between tasks. So this is a function that gives you a channel and a port. Um, so this is a de -sugar, or a de structuring let assignment. So you can actually, if you're, the channel returns both ends of the channel that you're making, and it assigns them to each variable. So this is assigning two variables in one line, basically. Um, and then we spin up a procedure, and we say result equals 5, and then send the result down the channel. And then in the main function, again, we say result equals point or port dot receive, and then we print out the result. So this will basically spin up a task generate a reference to 5, pass it through the channel, and then we'll get it back out in the main thread again. Um, and this lets you communicate between tasks without having to share a mutable state between them. Um, now, you may be wondering how the channel actually gets into the uh, procedure there that's being spawned. And basically, Rust will, uh, it knows that you're using that channel inside of the procedure, and therefore automatically transfers ownership over to it. So, um, I'll show you an example where this actually fails in the next slide. So if I was going to be sending a value of 5 down the channel, this would also work. So this like dereferences this value of 5. And it knows that the channel, um, the, the, the task is using x, and it's using the channel. So it sort of gives them to it. But then those become invalid in the, ex in the um, extra scope. So if we tried to use x after we spawned that procedure, like in this case, dereferencing x and adding 1 to the value, which is wrong for two different reasons, um, we'll get two different compiler errors. The first one is error use of moved value x. Note x moved into a closure environment because it has this appropriate type, which is non-copyable. Perhaps you meant to use clone. And so this is saying, hey, your closure, your procedure is already using the value of x. It could be mutating x. It could be doing whatever to x. That reference is no longer valid. And so Rust will actually, at compile time, prevent you from ch sending mutable state over a concurrency boundary, which is like super mind-blowingly amazing if you've ever had to debug concurrency issues around mutable state. Um, and the other thing is it'll give you an error, cannot assign to immutable dereference of the pointer, because like x is immutable, and I tried to add 1 to it. So it's wrong in two different ways. 
But this is an example of Rust giving you these like really strong guarantees um, about mutability and about safety, um, which is super, super cool. Um, pattern matching. This is an example of something that comes from the functional world that Rust has implemented in a way that basically boils down to a case statement, but is much more powerful. Um, you can say match and then some sort of expression and then give it arbitrary like arms, they call them, matching arms. So if this number is 0, it will print 0. If it's 1 or 2, it will print 1 or 2. If it's from the range of 3 to 10, it will print 3 to 10. And then if it's anything else, the underscore basically just means ignore it, print something else. This is cool um, because, first of all, we can come up with relatively complicated expressions on the, excuse me, on the left-hand side of this to actually match against. But the, the most interesting part is the last part. I forget if I have an error message here. Uh, I don't, so I'll just tell you what it is. If I had left out that underscore whatever, Rust would give me a compile time error saying non-exhaustive match statement. So Rust actually knows that you need to be able to, you're passing in an integer type, and therefore you should handle every possible integer that comes in. And if you don't handle all the cases, it will give you an error. Um, that's why we need this bottom to sort of say any other integer we don't care about. And this is cool because usually what happens is if you're not handling a case, that's, an ins that's a possibility for a problem of some kind. So to sort of bump this up a notch, um, Rust has option types, which if you've used something like Haskell you're familiar with. So we're saying let message equals sum and then a string howdy, um, a reference to a string, a, st a heap allocated string howdy. And um, sum is a type in Rust called option. So option basically is made up of two subtypes sum and none. And what that means is if it's sum, a, a computation is succeeded. And if it's none, it is failed. So what we can do is we can say match message. And if it's sum m, print it out. Otherwise, if it's none, do nothing. So this is very, very similar to null pointers, if you're familiar with null pointers at all. Um, Rust does not have the concept of null, basically, in the language at all. The guy who invented null calls it my billion dollar mistake. Null pointer dereferences have caused many a security issue. And so Rust does not allow you to have things that are null. It does how you allow you to use this sum none along with match to sort of emulate uh, a null value, but in a way that is checked at compile time. So it's impossible to dereference a null thing because you get this none back, and you have to handle it in some fashion. Um, and you can't forget to do it because it will, if you try to use message without using this match to like fetch stuff out of it, then you would, um, it would be the wrong type. It would be some string instead of a string. Um, and this happens often when you're like, so in this case it's trivial, we can see it's obviously going to succeed. But if you imagine that message was, for example, reading from a file, right, um, you may get a string back, you may not get a string back. Um, it depends. So option types are super cool. Closures, um, I've already mentioned, are like a first class concept. So you can actually define a variable square that is a closure that takes one argument of x that's an integer and returns a uint back and basically does x times x as uint, since it should always be positive. You want to cast it to a positive uh, integer. And then um, you know, let mute max equals 0, 1, 2, 3 dot map, and then pass in a closure that's you know, anonymous in this case instead of named, um, and do all your normal stuff here. And so this actually is like pretty efficient. Um, because it's a language level feature, we know how to compile this down into something that's reasonable. And so you don't actually, it's a stack allocated closure, um, which is faster than you might think. Um, generics. Rust has generics. Woohoo! Um, generics are amazing and wonderful. Um, they kind of look a little scary. This is one of the downsides of using a strongly, strongly typed language, is that at first, the type signatures can get pretty intense. So this is actually relatively simple. This is the definition of map from up here, applying this closure to every single element of the array. Um, but it uses generics. So the function map takes two generic parameters, t and u, and it takes a vector of type reference to an array of t, and a function that takes in a t and returns a u and returns a list of u's. Whew. Um, it gets better the more you read it. Um, and we argued about the syntax a lot. And this is one of the more complicated type signatures I should possibly show you. I shouldn't say possibly, but like, this is a higher than average complexity type signature because this is a library function that would be written by a library author. You would not generally like, write this yourself. Um, but I wanted to show you that like, it can get complicated, and that's a downside of using a strongly typed language. This is like why people don't use Scala, right? It's because Scala's like, type signatures are like, super intense and ridiculous. Um, it happens. 
But this will generically uh, operate over any type T um, or U. And what's cool about it is Rust actually does monomorphization. So this is not actually dynamically dispatched. When you use this map function, it will, it will statically determine all of the types you ever call map on and then generate specialized versions of these functions that operate natively on those types and statically dispatch. So it is the same speed as if you hand wrote a custom map type for every single type you use map for, but you don't have to do it yourself, which is awesome. Um, structs and traits. So Rust has structs, which work just like C structs, down to the way they're represented in memory, which is super useful for FFI, I'll talk about in a little bit. So this is a time bomb struct with an explicivity uint value. You can put whatever value you want in there. But Rust has this interesting system called traits. Um, Rust does not directly support object-oriented programming um, directly, but it has this trait system, which is neat. So what we can do is we can say, I want an implementation of a trait named drop for the time bomb struct. And Rust uses the drop trait to implement destructors, basically. So what I'm doing is I'm defining a destructor for time bomb by defining this drop trait. The drop trait mandates that I write a drop function um, that does something. So in this case, whenever my time bomb goes out of scope, it will print blam n times where n is the explicivity value that is stored in the struct. Um, and a lot of Rust's features, like language level features, are implemented via this trait system. So for example, um, you know, destructor is normally a language level feature or technically a library level feature where when the variable goes out of scope, it calls this function on it. Um, the, it Rust does not have operator overloading, but the equals, greater than, less than, negation are all implemented in terms of operating on a trait type. So if you define the EQ trait on your struct, you can get like overloaded operators, but not like super intense, like arbitrary overloaded operators. Um, you can also define traits on any type at all. So um, you can define a trait on an int, and that will be totally fine. And that gets super intense. Um, traits can also be parameterized in the same way that you, know, you saw generics earlier. So this is a sequence trait. Um, and this is what a trait definition looks like. So if I was a library author and I wanted to do stuff with sequences, I would say a sequence of t's, you need a length uh, function that uh, returns a uint. And then, for example, I could implement type t for the sequence of type t's for an array of t's, uh, a heap allocated array, um, and then say the value, like implementing that function is basically calling self.len, because arrays already have a length method defined on it that fulfills this like, sequence thing. Um, this is just more about like, syntax than something that's actively useful. But um, you can parameterize traits, which is super neat. Um, so more trait stuff. As I said, you can technically implement traits on int. So um, Yehuda Katz of Ruby and then Ember fame um, decided to try to port active support to Rust just to see what would happen. This is not a good example. You should never use code like this. This is bad, but it's cool. So you can say let time equals time dot now, and then print ln time, and then print ln two dot days dot from now, and this works. And it actually works the same as if you had written the functions to call it. It just looks like object-oriented E. Um, again, it's all statically dispatched, and technically only integers within the area that says use active support period and use active support time, get these patches. So another library, you're never going to have the problem. Like in Ruby, if you do this, integer forever has days on it as a method, and that causes lots of problems. This is only in the scope that you actually made the use. So other modules will not be affected by this. It's only your code, which is kind of neat. Um, but yeah, this is a terrible idea. You shouldn't write code like this. But this is one of the reasons why people from higher level languages are interested in Rust, because you can be as expressive as you can in Ruby. Like Traditionally, people are like, well, you know, C++ is gross and complicated. I'd rather use Ruby, which allows me to express things at a high level. And so with Rust's trait system combined with its like, high level map and filter features and like the closure stuff, it feels a lot like a higher level language, even though it is truly super low level. Um, this is another example of implementing traits. I'm not going to bother going through all of it. Um, but you can just like, see that a period trait, this is how the, the thing works in active support, is that like, the two dot seconds returns a time change object. And then on the time change, well, not object, but struct. And the time change struct has another trait implemented on it that like, makes all those things happen. Um, so if you screwed it up, it would be compile time error. Um, FFI is another awesome thing about Rust. Rust has an amazing FFI system. So you can call into C code however you want. Um, 
which is really great. It's been helpful to bootstrap a lot of the ecosystem because we can wrap C libraries instead of re-implementing our own. For example, uh, it has been decreed that there will be no official re-implementation of crypto libraries in Rust itself. We will link to C1s because people have actually written that code and audited it, and we don't want to screw anything up, and we want to be very careful about crypto. So bindings to libssl or whatever else it is, um, OpenSSL. Um, so this also has one other interesting feature of Rust that I want to talk about, which is unsafe. So here's the thing. All of this like uh, discipline, the Rust compiler, make sure that everything works for you is really nice. But sometimes you are smarter than the compiler. And so Rust gives you the ability to say unsafe, and then a curly brace, and a closed curly brace. And then that, restrict, that lifts a lot of the restrictions. Not all of them, but a lot of the restrictions around dangerous operations. So for example, inside of an unsafe block, you can do arbitrary pointer arithmetic. But outside of an unsafe block, that is impossible. And the reason is because Rust is ultimately a pragmatist language. And so we understand that sometimes you will need to write code where you, the human verifies that it's safe for performance reasons or like what other, other reasons. So for example, an FFI would not work because the C code does not provide the appropriate guarantees through to Rust. Like when you're calling into arbitrary C code, anything could happen, right? So Rust needs this unsafe flag to be able to tell you, I, the human, am overriding what you say, compiler, and I promised you this code is safe. And then when your code seg faults later, you know to only look at the unsafe blocks instead of the rest of your code. So you basically get like static analysis to make sure you haven't done anything dangerous on most of your code. If you've ever tried to like solve a, a dangling pointer problem in a large C++ code base, you love and know Valgrind, and it like kind of works, but you gotta like cross your fingers, and you're like a detective. With Rust, you have very, very small amounts of unsafe blocks, and you can audit those areas, and it's much, much easier to figure it out. So in this case, I'm, I'm linking to an external library called Snappy, which is like a gzip library. Um, and I'm saying I expect this extern symbol, um, Snappy max compressed length. And this is basically just a copy of the header file, but in Rust syntax as opposed to C syntax. Um, and I had to import libc's size t type to make that happen. Um, and then in main, I call unsafe snappy max compressed length of 100, and it will print out the results. And so this just calls in the C, and it's really trivial, and it's awesome. Um, now, that would be a pretty poor wrapper. Like, you would never use the C library this way. The idea would be that you would move the unsafe code into a safe Rust code, and you would expose a natural Rust wrapper on top of your unsafe stuff. And so this is much more common. Um, and so you're essentially promising the invariance that the Rust compiler would do to your um, code above it. And then this is like the way that it would really happen um, is like this is an uncompressed function that uses that snappy uncompressed length, but does a whole bunch of other stuff with like pointer arithmetic and like vector capacity stuff and mutating things that like would not really be allowed otherwise, um, and returns a sum compressed thing or a none if there's a fail. And so this is an example of like a real wrapper around a, a C library. It doesn't really matter what it does. I'm just trying to show you some syntax so you can sort of see what it looks like vaguely. But it's really convenient to work with C code, and that means that there's a lot of really nice things about it um, that that works. Um, because you can totally drop into super low level, uh, you know, whatever you want. People, multiple people have started writing operating systems in Rust. Um, there's an amazing blog I really, really love, um, Bork with a zero. Uh, Julia Evans, I believe is her actual name, uh, has been writing this uh, blog series about making an operating system in Rust. And it is the most wonderful piece of like classic hacker programmer. I have no idea what I'm doing, but this is so amazing and like joyful. It's like my favorite. These like 15 or 20 posts she wrote about it is like, hey, today pressing a key on my keyboard doesn't crash my crash my machine anymore. Like I'm making progress, and it's really great. But she bring she explains how she's actually building an operating system from nothing in Rust, and it's super cool. And you should check it out if you like mega low level stuff. Um, okay. So uh, hopefully I've given you a little bit of taste of what makes Rust cool. Like concurrency stuff is super awesome. Um, the like safety the compiler gives you is great. You don't have to do as much housekeeping. Like everything's really awesome um, about Rust. But if you want to learn more, obviously you're not. You know you probably vaguely even understand what's going on at this point because I just showed you a bunch of syntax. So later, um, hopefully you'll go check it out. Here are some things you can do to learn more about Rust. Um, so there are a bunch of really great projects that people have written in Rust that can give you an example of like what a real program looks like. So for example, um, Rust Boot is a project that brings up from, it's the assembly shim that goes from a 32-bit computer to a Rust like K-main 
basically like the, when you're writing actual kernel code in Rust. So that was the precursor project to the one I was just telling you about um, that Julia wrote. Um, there's Rust HDP, which is an HDP library that is written in Rust that's super neat. They're actually experimenting with using typed uh, header values. So it can like tell you if it's an experimental header or a standardized header, um, things like that. Uh, Rust Core is a Rust that without any of the uh, standard libraries. So you could use it on embedded devices. There's some people doing cool stuff with that. Sprocket NES is a Nintendo emulator written in Rust that can play Mario, which is super cool. Um, Rusty Mem, Rust Redis, and Rust Message Pack are native Rust re-implementations of the Redis and memcached protocols. So you get like real wrappers for those things. And Engelmoi, I think that's how you say it, because well, who knows, uh, Rust is this game. It's like Beatmania, if you're or like DDR, but written in Rust. So it's a full video game that's like eight or nine thousand lines of Rust. That's like super cool too, as an example. Um, so you can check out those like real world projects. Um, the other thing I forgot entirely was Servo. I have three minutes, so I can hurry up and say this. The, thing, the other thing that, so Rust is implemented in Rust. It's one of the largest Rust code bases. The second largest co Rust code base is Servo. Servo is a browser rendering engine that Mozilla is writing in Rust to build a next generation, massively parallel, completely safe rendering engine so that hopefully they don't get pwned to owned in the future by Gecko stuff. Um, so it is like 150,000 lines of Rust or whatever. And the Rust language takes lessons used from building Servo, a real world application, in the language itself. So they feed back into each other. So Servo will try out a new feature. And it'll say, actually, that's terrible. And then it'll get removed from the compiler. And then like, oh, we actually do need this other thing. And it'll get added. And that's been one of the big drivers of making Rust a practical um, language is because it has itself and also a major component that is being written in it to help drive it in a practical way. Um, as far as other introductions to Rust, there is an official tutorial, which is terrible. Um, they're paying someone currently to rewrite it, but it's not yet been rewritten. So it's been cobbled together by systems programmers over the last six years. And um, you know, they're amazing at low-level programming and terrible at writing. So uh, I wrote a tutorial called Rust for Rubius, like I mentioned before, a long time ago, that a lot of people think is better. I have to toot my own horn too much. Um, I tried to rewrite the official tutorial, but there was a miscommunication with Mozilla. It didn't work out. Um, so I'm talking to the person who's writing it to help them with it. Um, and there's also a Rust Tutorials NG project. Um, there are a bunch of places to discuss Rust. So there's a Rust dev mailing list that Mozilla runs. There's a subreddit, which I hate Reddit, but the Rust subreddit is OK. Um, there's an, a Mozilla chat room um, on irc.mozilla.org. And there's a really great blog post series written by CMR called This Week in Rust that gives you a summary of what has gone on in the last week. It's often a new way to like check out what cool stuff has been happening in Rust world. Um, and then finally, you can check out the actual code to Rust at github.com slash Mozilla slash Rust. And rust-lang.org is the official website, although I forgot to put a link to it on here. So with that, I am exactly at time, give or take 30 seconds, I guess. So thank you for listening to me talk about Rust. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it at the after party or whatever. Um, or you know, after we do whatever it is thing we're doing here, like I was told a minute ago. So uh, thank you so much.